of Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 12, and uh, I'm going to share with you for a few minutes this morning about what I call 3C prayers, 3C prayers, Acts chapter 12. Uh, let me just kind of give you the lay of the land this morning. Uh, I am going to preach the shortest sermon that you've heard me preach so far. You better pray, but I've been doing better. I was a little shorter each, each time, so I was shorter in first than on Saturday night. I was shorter in second than in first, so um, hey, I'm done. Let's, uh, no. <laughs> But uh, I'm going to share with you quickly from Acts 12. Then we're going to receive communion together. And uh, the reason that we want to try and let you go a little bit early today is because over in the dome, all of our ministries have set up tables so that you can go over and uh, you can take a look and see all the different ministries of our church, acquaint yourself with all that we're doing. And even more than that, uh, if you're part of our church family, if you worship here regularly, we want you to sign up and volunteer uh, and begin serving in our different ministries. I'm going to tell you that serving is an important part of Christian discipleship. If you want to know what makes the Dead Sea dead is that it has no outlet. It is constantly receiving, but it never gives anything out. And that is a recipe for spiritual stagnation. And so if you're not serving, we want you to volunteer to serve in some of our ministries. And uh, as we serve, our, our heart grows for people. We grow in God's love for people. We serve God by serving one another here on earth. And so we hope that you'll do that. Uh, also, just before we leave the sanctuary today, we have a group that's getting ready to go to Bangladesh at the end of the month. There's a dozen people from Harvest Time who are going. This is our third trip to Bangladesh, and uh, we're going to be going and doing a medical clinic. We're going to be doing another clean water project, feeding people, uh, and most importantly, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our, our pastor friend that we work with in Bangladesh in August baptized one thousand new believers and he has asked us they want to give a Bible and a blanket to every new believer it costs ten dollars to buy a Bible in the Bengali language and a blanket for a new believer and so at the end of the service today we're going to have an opportunity as you go out to just share an offering and uh, I hope that their budget for the trip is thirty thousand dollars and uh, I think we can help them towards that today with our offering and our giving. Look with me in Acts chapter 12, and let's talk about 3C prayers. Acts chapter 12, and beginning in verse 1, it says, About this time, King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Won't take time to read all of the verses of Acts chapter 12, but I think most of you are familiar with this story. On the night before Peter's trial, an angel showed up in his prison and struck Peter on the side. And when Peter woke up, his shackles fell off of his wrists. The angel told him, get up and get dressed and come with me. And they walked through locked door after locked door. They opened automatically. Peter went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where there were believers praying, and he knocked on the door. And one of the funniest incidents in the New Testament happened. A little slave girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she heard Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran up stairs to tell everybody that Peter was there but she forgot to open the door and when she told them they didn't believe her but Peter kept knocking and they found out that Peter really was there I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the power of 3c prayer there was a little boy who was lying on the grass one summer morning Puffy white clouds were rolling by and he was looking at the shapes of the clouds and he began to think about God and wondered whether God was really there. Finally, he said out loud, he said, God, are you really there? To his astonishment, a voice answered back from the clouds. Yes, I am here. What can I do for you? Seizing the opportunity, the little boy said, God, 
What is a million years like to you? Knowing that a little boy couldn't grasp the concept of eternity, God said to him, oh, a million years to me is like a minute. And then the boy said, well, then what's a million dollars like to you? And God said, a million dollars to me is like a penny. Wow, said the boy. God, you're so generous. Can I have one of your pennies? And God said, sure, just give me one minute. Lord, we need pennies from heaven, and we don't have a minute to spare. For the last few weeks, we've been talking about great prayers. James said the reason God doesn't answer your prayers is they're just not that great. They're self-centered. They're self-gratifying. They're self-promoting. But, James went on to say, if you'll pray for one another, then God will answer your prayers. What are great prayers? Great prayers are big. Great prayers are bold. They ask God for extraordinary mercies and extraordinary miracles. Great prayers are biblical. They're informed by the truth of this book, and they're directed to the God of this book. Great prayers are benevolent and beneficial. They move the heart and the hand of God. Great prayers touch heaven. And they make real changes here on the earth. Acts 12 gives us one of the greatest examples of the power of corporate prayer, corporate intercession. And looking at the Jerusalem church, I find a 3C pattern for prayer that I want to share with you quickly. What is 3C prayer? First of all, the first C stands for corporate prayers. If the fervent prayer of one righteous man is powerful and effective, imagine how much more powerful and effective are the fervent prayers of many righteous men and women together. Jesus said, if two or three of you agree together in my name in prayer, then nothing will be impossible for you. Can I tell you, we need to try that out more. We need to put Jesus' words to the test more because we need miracles now more than we've ever needed them before. Pray in your prayer pup tent, but don't forget to pray with others. Pray with your spouse. Pray with your children. Pray with a prayer partner. Pray with a circle, a small prayer circle of friends. Pray with your church family and see what God will do. 3C, prayer. Corporate prayer and the second C stands for constant prayers. It strikes me that when Peter was sprung from prison in the middle of the night, he knew exactly where to go. He knew exactly where he would find his brothers and sisters. He knew what he would find them doing. He knew that they would be praying. Verse 5 of Acts 12 says they were a church of constant prayer. The home that belonged to Mary, the mother of John Mark, was the first 24-7 house of prayer. The upper room in her home is where Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples. It's where the resurrected Christ appeared to the disciples on the first day of the week when the doors and windows were locked because of fear of the Jews. It's where the disciples went after the ascension when Jesus told them, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. During that 10 days between the ascension and the day of Pentecost is when that 24-7 prayer meeting began in Mary's house. On Pentecost morning, there was the sound of a tornadic wind that caught the attention of everyone in Jerusalem, and tongues of fire sat on the heads of every one of the 120 gathered in that prayer room, and they spoke in tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. And now, here in Acts 12, all these years later, at least 15 years after the day of Pentecost, we find that that 24-7 prayer meeting was still going on. We're getting ready to build phase two, our new sanctuary, but I have to tell you, after phase two, there's a phase three on my heart. I don't talk about it much because I don't want to scare you, but the phase three that I want to build is a 24-7 prayer chapel. God's already given a vision of the design of it to me, and I already have a vision of a church of constant prayer. But here's what I want you to see about the Jerusalem church. Through thick and thin, they kept on praying. 
They prayed in the early days when the gospel was spreading through Jerusalem like wildfire. They prayed when the followers of Jesus were held in high admiration, high esteem by all the people. And then they kept on praying when persecution broke out against the church. They kept on praying when internal conflicts divided believers in the church. They kept on praying when the public favor that they once enjoyed turned into public scorn. Beloved, there's a word of encouragement for us from Acts chapter 12. Don't ever quit praying. No matter what, don't you give up praying. Don't give in, even though the tide of popular opinion may turn against the church. God has not forgotten us. In spite of setbacks and losses, in spite of problems within and persecution from without, keep on praying because God still has mighty miracles up his sleeve waiting for us. 3C, prayer, corporate prayer, constant prayer. And the third C is crisis prayers. The execution of James was a great setback for the Jerusalem church. He was the first one of the 12 to be killed, to be martyred. Previously, God had delivered James and, uh, uh, excuse me, Peter and John on several occasions. And up until now, the 12 seemed to be untouchable. But the death of James shattered that notion. Now it was the night before Peter's trial. Herod was committed to the outcome of a death sentence. Time was almost up. It was the 11th hour. And in the 11th hour, the corporate and constant prayer that the church was accustomed to was kicked into high gear. Luke says in verse 5 that they were in earnest prayer. Luke uses that word only one other time to describe prayer, and that was how Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was crisis prayer. I wonder, what do you do at the 11th hour? What do you do when it seems like time has run out? What do you do when it seems like you're powerless against the enemy that is threatening to take you down? What do you do when it seems like the outcome is a foregone conclusion? What do you do when you hear the word inoperable? What do you do when you hear the word irreconcilable? What do you do when you hear the word impossible? Do you give up? Do you roll over and wait to die? Do you just uh, surrender yourself to the hands of fate? You know, the early church didn't do that. When difficult times came, they got together and they prayed harder. James, the brother of Jesus, was part of that 3C prayer meeting in Mary's house. No wonder he wrote to us later on, if anyone is in trouble, he should pray. So that's 3C, prayer. Praying together, praying continuously, and praying extra hard when trouble comes. Beloved, there's a word of encouragement from Acts 12. Corporate and constant and crisis prayers actually change the course of human history. 3C prayers actually change outcomes. They actually change God's mind. Beloved, we're getting ready to embark on the greatest faith venture in the history of this church so far. We've set a goal to break ground on phase two next summer. This month, we're launching a capital campaign called Jump In, and we have a goal to raise more money than we have ever raised before. This week, we sent stacks and stacks of construction documents over to Town Hall to begin the process of getting our building permit. It takes about six or seven months to get a building permit. But I want to tell you, over the next 10 months, it's going to take an effort of 3C prayer. It's going to take corporate prayer and constant prayer, and it's going to take crisis prayer to get us to groundbreaking on our new building and to get us into our new home. God has given us... A dream that is God-sized. It's too big for us alone. But if we'll gather together in prayer and agree in Jesus' name, I believe nothing is impossible. What are the outcomes of 3C prayer? I want to give a few that I find here in Acts 12 as quick as I can. The outcomes of 3C prayer. First of all, 3C prayer saves lives. The corporate and constant and crisis prayers of the Jerusalem church saved Peter's lives and we can save lives as well. Outcomes of 3C prayer 
three C prayer sets people free. Peter was as bound as any person could be. He was behind layers of iron bars. He was chained to two soldiers. He was in the clutches of a demonized dictator. But 3C prayer set him completely free. And our prayers can set people free too. Do you know the Bible says God is able to save to the uttermost those who come to him through Jesus. That means that God is able to do a lot more than just little incremental improvements in people's lives. God is able to set people completely free. No matter how messed up they are, no matter how imbalanced or unstable or tormented they are, God can set them free, can set them free and our prayers can do that. Outcomes of 3C prayer. 3C prayer releases supernatural peace on suffering and persecuted believers. I don't know how many of us have ever had to go to court, but if you've ever had to go to court, I wonder how well you slept on the night before. It was the night before Peter was going to go stand capital trial. And trials did not drag on in Jerusalem. They believed in swift justice over there, so trials and executions happened on the same day. It was Passover week, the same time of year that Jesus was executed. A few years earlier, James had just been put to death by the sword. He had been beheaded, and that pleased the people of the city. This was very likely Peter's last night on earth, and he was sound asleep. He was in such a deep sleep that the radiant light of an angel in his prison cell didn't even wake him up. The angel had to give him a thwack on the hip to wake him. How could he sleep fast on a night like that? He had a supernatural peace. Like the peace that Jesus had asleep in the boat in a storm. Stephen had that same peace. Paul had that same peace. 3C prayer gives that kind of peace. There's something that we can do for believers who are suffering here. There's something that we can do for brothers and sisters who are hurting, who are sick, who are grieving, who are anxious. We can pray for them and the peace of God that transcends understanding can come upon them and guard their hearts and guard their minds. They won't go cuckoo. They, they won't go out of their minds. They won't give in to hope or despair because of the peace that comes through our prayers. There's something that we can do for our brothers and sisters who are suffering persecution all around the world today. Did you ever notice that when Muslim factions fight each other, it's always the Christians who die? Almost 1,000 Christians have been martyred in Egypt since July of this year. In the city of Homs, Syria, 1,500 Christians have been martyred this year alone. Our friend Canon Andrew White from Baghdad, Iraq, has seen over 1,000 members of his congregation martyred in the last three years. It's estimated that 100 million Christians around the world are suffering severe persecution right now. And beloved, there's something that we can do to help them. We can get together and we can pray for them here and God can send his peace to them over there. Beloved, listen to me. Don't ever let anyone belittle the ministry in your, uh, of prayer in your mind as just some religious exercise that is less important than doing good deeds. Prayer is the most powerful thing that you and I can do. There's no border. There's no boundary line. There are no prison bars. There is no king, no country, no army that can stand against the power of the church of Jesus Christ when it begins to pray. What are the outcomes of 3C prayer? 3C prayer moves God to send angels to the rescue. There's a pattern in all the intercessory prayers that we've been looking at together over the last few weeks. Wherever there are intercessors, God has his angels at work. 
Hmm, that's good right there. The, there were angels at work when Abraham prayed. There were angels at work when Moses prayed, when Daniel prayed. Ezra doesn't mention angels specifically in the book of Ezra, but he wrote First and Second Chronicles, which details the accounts of angelic interventions. Angels are ministering spirits that God sends to help the heirs of salvation. Listen, if Jesus himself needed at times to come and receive ministry from an angel to be strengthened, how much more do you think that you and I perhaps need to be touched by an angel sometimes? And when we pray, God sends angels to the rescue, not only on our behalf, but on behalf of those that we love. As we pray, God will send angels to bring light to our loved ones who are in dark places. He'll send angels to release shackles. He'll send angels to awaken them from spiritual slumber. He'll send angels to start leading them towards freedom before they even wake up and realize what's happening to them. Outcomes of 3C prayer. 3C prayer supernaturally opens doors to our city. The angel hit Peter on the side and said, get up and get dressed and follow me. I don't believe that. I believe that the guards were actually wide awake. They only worked in three hour shifts, but there is a certain kind of blindness. We read about in the Old Testament that angels bring upon people that even with their eyes wide open, they can't see what's happening in front of them. It's what happened in front of the door to Lot's house. The angels struck the men with a certain kind of blindness that even though their eyes were wide open, they couldn't find the door to Lot's house. When the angels came to rescue Elisha and his servant, there was a kind of blindness on the Syrian army that they didn't recognize who Elisha was or that he was leading them right into the arms of their enemies. I think that's what happened in P Peter's prison cell. I think with the guard's eyes wide open, Peter got up and got dressed and walked right out through the doors and they never saw him go. And the doors opened automatically. Actually, Peter had no problem getting out of the prison. He couldn't get into the house. <laughs> Beloved, as we pray, I believe that the locked gates of Greenwich are going to become open doors for us. I believe the locked doors of Stanford and the locked doors of Harrison and Purchase and Rye and Port Chester and New Rochelle and Mount Kisco and White Plains and Ossining and Tarrytown and New Canaan and Darien. I believe that locked doors are going to become automatically open doors for us. I want to tell you that the best is yet to come for our church and what God wants to do through us. 30 years ago, God promised Pastor Tate a harvest in this area. And I want to tell you, the roughly 2,000 people that come to all of our services, the English services, the Spanish services, I want to tell you that that group is just a drop in the bucket compared to the harvest that God wants us to realize and reap. So let's pray that locked doors will become open doors for us. Outcomes of 3C prayer. Got to hurry. 3C prayer releases. I'm out of breath, y'all. 3C prayer releases miracles that are bigger than our level of faith. This is one of the funniest stories. I'm sure for years after this night, whenever they got together, they said, Ah, yeah, you remember that time that Rhoda left Peter out in the street? And Peter knew exactly where to go. He knew where he would find his friends. He knew what they would be doing. And when he knocked on the gate, a girl named Rhoda came. Rhoda means Rose. Nice Italian girl, Rose, came. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so excited that she ran upstairs and she told everyone, Peter is here. And they told her, you are out of your mind. What that tells me is that their level of faith did not match the fervor of their prayers. I can't believe that they were only praying for courage for Peter. I can't believe that they were only praying that he would die well like Stephen had. I can't believe that they were praying that his death would be quick and painless. I have to believe that they were praying fervently for his release like God had done before. But apparently they weren't really expecting the miracle because when Peter showed up at the door, they didn't believe it. You know, sometimes we're like that. Sometimes we're like the father of the tormented boy who confessed honestly to Jesus, Lord, I... I believe, but help my unbelief. 
thank God he does miracles that are bigger than the level of our faith. The believer's response to Rhoda is interesting. They said it must be his angel. The Jewish people believed that a person's guardian angel resembled the person that they guarded, that they looked and sounded like the person. There's other strong evidence for guardian angels in the Bible, in the words of Jesus, in the Psalms, but there's nothing in the Bible, nothing else to substantiate this tradition that a guardian angel looked and sounded like his charge. But I had a rather unusual experience a week ago that reminded me a lot of Acts chapter 12. When the Greenwich outpouring started last summer, I I felt very deeply impressed that I needed to meet John Arnott. John Arnott is the pastor of the Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship where the Toronto outpouring, the Toronto blessing happened many years ago. Never met him, never even heard him speak, but I just felt impressed like I needed to meet him told that to my friend Ken Gott, and Ken said, Glenn, I'm going up to Toronto for the 20th anniversary of the Toronto blessing. He said, why don't you come with me, and I'll introduce you to John and Carol. So I flew up last week for a quick trip, and we had dinner with John and Carol Arnott. The next day, we had lunch with them and with Randy Clark, who was very instrumental in the uh, Toronto outpouring. And the last thing I ever expected was to be standing on the platform at the Toronto Airport Fellowship speaking at the 20th anniversary. But when I told them about the Greenwich outpouring, they wanted me to share it with everybody. Didn't expect to be standing there, and the last thing I expected was to be lying on my face on the platform at the Toronto Airport Fellowship. I wish I could describe the atmosphere there to you. The air is like liquid. And it's charged. When they say certain things, it's like electrical charges just go through the room. And in the presence of the Lord, I found myself once again lying on my face on a platform. And John Arnott came and knelt down beside me and put his hand on my head. And I could hear his voice praying for me. For a long time, a half hour or more, I I was there out on the floor. And the whole time he was kneeling next to me with his hand heavy on my head and his voice right in my ear and he was praying he's a very distinct he's a 70 year old man he has a very distinct deep voice and he was praying more anointing lord more anointing increase the anointing lord increase the anointing and when the meeting was over we went back to a speaker's room and i I said to ken i said ken i said how long was john praying for me and ken said to me glenn john arnott never left his seat He was sitting in the front row the entire time. I said, no, Ken, he was kneeling next to me, praying for me. I'm sure that he was. I said, there was a hand on my head, heavy. He said, Glenn, nobody was touching you. Nobody had their hand on your head. There were some young ministry interns on the platform just looking after people that were there. But there was a hand on my head, and it was John Arnott's voice in my ear. I said, no, he was there. He he said, no, nobody was there next to you. And Lois Gott said to me, Glenn, it must have been an angel. I've often heard speakers talk about being aware of an angel with them as they're ministering. You know, there's not enough evidence in the Bible to either support or deny that. But if John Arnott does have an angel, then it must have been his angel that touched me. I don't really know what that means. I don't really know what's going to happen. But I do know that the next time I lay hands on people, the first person I touch is going to get it big time. God does miracles that are bigger than the level of our faith. The outcomes of 3C prayer. You better help me, worship team, jump up if you would. Finally, this 3C prayer causes the church to prevail against evil attacks and demonized human rulers. Herod was a thoroughly demonized human leader. He came from a long line of demonized despots. He was driven by unclean and tormenting and bloodthirsty and anti-Christ spirits. The wave of persecution that broke out against the church in Acts 12 was a demonically inspired wave of persecution to snuff out the life of Peter, the life of the apostles, and to stop the advance of the church. 
Beloved, can I tell you that more and more demonized human leaders are appearing on the world stage and even right here in our own country. It is on like Donkey Kong. Persecution is escalating against the church here in the United States of America and all around the world, but we are not without hope in the world. We have on our side the power of 3C prayer. Acts chapter 12 begins with James dead, Peter in prison, and Herod triumphant. Acts 12 ends with Herod dead, with Peter free, and with the word of God triumphant. Thanks be to God, he always causes us to triumph through our Lord Jesus Christ. So now you know the secret of 3C prayer, corporate, constant, and crisis prayer will help us to overcome in this world. Would you stand on your feet and would you give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place. Come on, let's give him a great big praise in this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. 